Thank you, Doug. President Antonio Maceda, thank you very much. When he was a young boy, Doug Becker lived in France for two years only. I think his French is pretty good, don't you? He's been there a long time. I won't even try. I'd like to begin by thanking the representatives of government who are here. I thank the Minister of Communication, the Deputy Minister of Higher Education, the Mayor, all the business leaders who are here, and the American Ambassador, Ambassador Sam Kaplan, and Sylvia Kaplan, thank you for your presence here, all the business leaders who have come, and the students, there are a lot of students here. I think about half the seats have been reserved for them. And since all the future belongs to them, that was a very good decision as well. I, uh, I want to begin by saying just a word or two about the Laureate University Network. I am honored to serve as the honorary chancellor of a network that has almost 700,000 students in 55 institutions, actually more than that now, in more than two dozen countries around the world. Because Laureate represents a part of what I think the 21st century world must look like and work like if we are going to make the most of it. That if we live in the most interdependent age in history. Not just trade, but travel, investment, and the internet. I keep reading articles in the American press about things that happened 20 years ago because that's when I became president. I had, it was a long time ago. But not so long ago, 20 years ago when I became president, the average cell phone weighed five pounds. And on the entire internet, there were 50 sites. More than that had been added since I began to speak here. So the good news about the modern world is that children, eight and nine years old can get on the internet and find out things that I had to go to the university to learn. And the bad news is you can also get on the internet and learn how to make a bomb. The good news is we can share more information than ever before. The bad news is that cyber security will be one of the big concerns of people throughout the world in the 21st century. The modern world has a lot to offer. And those of you who are students here symbolize that. You are a part of the university community that will give you a chance to develop your own ability, give you a chance to know and relate to people who are different from you, which is very important in an interdependent world. And when you leave here, give a chance to contribute to the welfare of your nation, to have a personally fulfilling life, and to help the world grow. That's the good news. But there are several challenges that we face, and I believe almost all of them can be put in three categories. First, you have to ask yourself, if the world is interdependent, what does that mean? It simply means that our fates, our futures, are all connected. We are bound together, whether we like it or not. But interdependence can be good or bad or both. Human beings being what we are, the answer is today, both. For all the opportunities you have been offered, 
The world is still in the grip of a global jobs crisis. There aren't enough jobs for all the people who wish to work, particularly for the young. And there is, on top of that, in my opinion at least, entirely too much inequality in incomes and access to education and health care and lots of other things. Now, if you believe in market economies, which have done a better job of creating opportunity and eliminating poverty than any other economic system, you have to accept some inequality. You have to reward people who have good ideas or who run things better or who work harder. It's what makes markets go. There has to be some possibility of really being rewarded for being good and for creating opportunity for other people. But if there is too much inequality, then you restrict the very economy that you support. I'll just start with America. You know, if you look in the United States, in the last decade, more than 90% of the gains have gone to only 10% of us. About half the gains, income gains in the last decade have gone just to 1%. It's too much. It's a terrific constraint on growth, besides being very burdensome for the people who are trying to raise their children and live in dignity and work hard and contribute to our country. So the trick is, how do you have a good market economy which rewards the people who are driving it and creating opportunity without going so far that you cause all of this to stop? Severe inequality is a limit on economic growth. Second problem we have is instability. In any creative, free society, there must be some instability. If you look at all the business people who are here, if you want to reward somebody in business for their successes, there has to be the possibility of failure. A friend of mine told me the other day that if you looked at the whole history of American economic life, one of the greatest things we ever did was to establish a bankruptcy law so people who failed could begin again. So you need a certain amount of instability. But if there is too much instability, it's just like too much inequality. Things shut down. It's hard to build a sense of social solidarity. People are afraid to take a risk. They wonder why they should go to work. They wonder why they should start a new business. And that's why we should worry about the financial crisis which started in America spreading all over the world like wildfire in no time. It's why we should worry about computer security. It's why we should worry about conflicts half a world away or just a few hundred miles away. And finally, the world we live in is being driven by a model that is not sustainable because of climate change, because of the way we produce and consume resources for energy, and because of local resource problems. For example, 90% of the world's fishing stocks are underpopulated. More than a billion people on Earth have fish as their main source of protein. In China, where they moved more people out of poverty through economics in less time than any other place in history, they are now worried because one of their two great rivers, the Yellow River, is dry at some time of the year. And they have attempted to solve this problem by constructing two great canals driven by gravity from the other great river, the Yangtze River, down to the Yellow River. A solution that some of the Chinese engineers, not environmental activists, engineers, 
Will these may drive no further. Therefore, China is likely to have more conflict with its neighbors because China is the source of the headwater of the Mekong River, which is the main river bringing fresh water into all of Southeast Asia. What's all this got to do with Morocco? If you live in an interdependent world, the job of everybody is to build up the positive forces of our interdependence and to manage the negative ones. You can't have too much inequality, you can't have too much instability, you can't have an unsustainable economic and social model and expect the world to grow together, to live in shared prosperity with shared responsibilities and a genuine sense of communal responsibility to one another. So think about Morocco. My family and I, my wife, her late mother, our daughter, we love this country. And it was a great honor for me to work with both the late king, Hassan, and his son. And I was excited to meet representatives of the new government because I like the idea that the country is becoming more democratic and more empowering. Democracy is a lot of trouble, by the way. We, we've been at it a long time, and we still have a lot of trouble with it. <laughs> but uh, Winston Churchill once said it is absolutely the worst form of government, except for all the others. But let me just give you a couple of examples now. If, if you believe that the job of the 21st century is to build up the positive forces of our interdependence, represented by the students here and the future of this university, and to reduce the negative ones, what does it mean that in the last couple of years Morocco has succeeded in giving reliable electricity to 95% of its people, including women? What does it mean? that illiteracy among women in rural Morocco, in the smaller places, in the poorer places, has gone down 40%. Big increase in literacy. What does it mean that the king appeared at a ceremony a couple of weeks ago to mark the restoration of the oldest synagogue in Morocco? and announced that they would all be restored, that it was a part of the country's heritage. A Muslim country, a man whose family was in the line of the Prophet. What does that mean? What does it mean that Morocco has 75% of the world's phosphate reserves? and so far has not made the mistake that a lot of oil-rich countries did in squandering the money, but instead had reinvested the money. I think it means, in every case, that the country is making decisions which are likely to create a shared future with shared prosperity and shared responsibilities. And that means that you have to have a model that encourages competition in an economic sense, but that in the end favors cooperation over constant conflict. A model that recognizes that there is a lot of diversity in this world of ours. And we have to find a way to be proud of our religion, proud of our race, proud of our gender, proud of our national identity, without having to do something negative to people who are different from us. We have to find a way to share the future. If you look around the world, the most successful societies are those who find ways to honor diversity.
diversity and embrace community, who enjoy competition in sports or economics, but value cooperation over pure conflict. The struggle of the 21st century, in many ways, is not an economic struggle. It is a struggle for identity. What does it mean to be a Muslim, a Christian, a Jew, a Hindu, a Buddhist? What does it mean to be faithful without being against the right of people who are in a different tradition to live the way you want to live. How can a country develop its human resources unless women have the same chances men do and girls growing up going to school have the same chances to develop? In a world where anybody can get on the internet and practically do anything, and you can have years of conversation with somebody unless they chose to tell you, you wouldn't know who, what their gender was because all the contact is indirect. What does it mean to fully develop the resources of the country? These are interesting questions. But what I see is that they're all connected because the places that are poorest are most vulnerable to resisting changes that empower girls and women, for example, because if there's not going to be any progress and you believe all your tomorrows are going to be just like yesterday, then you want to hold on to what you can't control, even if it doesn't make any sense. Places where things are getting better and where people can make a decent living makes people more secure and more able to imagine a different future. And it makes people freer to listen to the aspirations, to the complaints, to the dreams, to the gripes of other people. So, what does all this mean for you? It means, first, it's a very good thing to have an education because the world is every day moving closer to an economy where what you know depends more on how much physical labor you can do. And it also means that we have to find a way to solve this global jobs crisis. To give people the dignity of work wherever they live. And it means, in a larger sense, we have to find a way to continue to grow the economy without burning up the planet. So I'll give you another rock and head. What does it mean that there has been a serious consideration here in this country to developing your ability to generate electricity from the sun and the wind and then to have a subterranean cable to Europe, beginning in Spain, to sell clean electricity there? Is it a good thing? Yes, it is. We will still keep using oil, we will still keep using natural gas, but the truth is, that if you live in a place that has sun and wind, you can generate power for economic growth in a way that improves the chances of our children and grandchildren to do well economically instead of undermines them. So I ask you to think about all this because I'd be interested to see what happens now in your new political environment. I was in politics for 30 years and I loved it. Every now and then I get back in a little bit in an election.
question or something, somebody will ask me to come and do something. But I was thinking about this. We almost always just debated two questions. What are you going to do? And how much money are you going to spend on? The Minister of Communication then has to explain why the government is not spending more, or why it is spending more, right? Or why are you doing this instead of that? Is that right? But there is a third question, which at least in the years I was in politics, got nowhere near as much attention as what are you going to do and how much money are you going to spend. The third question is, whatever you intend to do, and however much money you have or don't have to spend on how do you propose to do it so that you turn your good intentions into real change? And I think that will be the most important question of the 21st century, certainly in the next 30 or 40 years. How? How do you propose to make Morocco a devoutly, overwhelmingly Muslim nation, a tolerant nation. Well, you, restoring the synagogue and saying that's an important part of your history and your tradition is not a bad place to start. How do you propose to take these phosphate reserves and turn them into the benefit of the society at large? Taking care of the fossils you found on the site not a bad place to start. It's a symbol that more than one good thing can come out of a natural resource. Building a new university is not a bad place to start. It's a symbol that you believe that 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, this country will be in a better place than it is now. The reason I got into the foundation business and all the things I do, which you heard Doug say in his introduction, is that I realized that I had always been obsessed with this. I have seen so many times when really good people who really wanted to do the right thing all over the world failed because they could not figure out how to do it. And that's why I started this Clinton Global Initiative, so that we would have people who get together every year and make commitments to solve problems. And in order to make the commitments, they had to figure out how they were going to keep them. So I urge you to think about that. I actually believe that Morocco can have an enormous impact. on the future of this region and on the world as you continue to grow, you continue to improve your democracy. If you manage your identity questions as you are, if you assume the international leadership positions that you have, and you show people a future with an open hand instead of a clenched fist, so, I ask you to think about it. I also hope that in addition to all these political changes, that civil society will grow stronger and stronger. I find that as countries develop, it's sometimes easier in the beginning for civil society to answer the how questions than for government or business. Why? Because businesses have to turn a profit. And they have to therefore have something of a short-term focus. And it's sometimes hard for government, at least it was for people like me, to say, oh, I made a real mistake, I have to do something else. I hope you will encourage in this newfound democracy all of your politicians 
to say they made a mistake when they know they have and not punish them for doing it. Because nobody's going to be right all the time. But in my foundation, we try to figure out how to do things faster, better, at lower cost. With government and with business trying to work together. And I think that building this kind of civil society is important. One of your students who's here today, Ray Hakamani, made a commitment at our Clinton Global Initiative for University Students to start an NGO, a civil society group called I Want to Be. Don't we all? It is a commitment to support the education of Moroccan school children and to stop the dropout of people once they do start school, which is also a huge problem in the United States. Where are you? She's here, Ralph. Right? Where are you? I know she's here somewhere, but I just saw her. There you go. You should give, let's give her a round of applause. Well, I introduced her to make this final point. You have some of the most important people in industry here, important people in finance here, leaders of the government here. There are two ways for you to be good citizens. One is to be informed about the affairs of government and how it react, interfaces with business and cast an intelligent vote and speak out on that. The other is do what you can. And I wanted her to stand up because one of the things the internet has done is to empower everybody to do public good as a private citizen. To learn from an early age that you can't leave it all up to people in government or to the captains of the private enterprise system. So I ask you to think about that as well. The 21st century will belong to the countries that do the best job of empowering all their people to make the most of their own lives. It will belong to the countries that find a way to embrace cooperation so that people don't deny their differences, not just their categorical differences like religion or gender or race, but their honest differences of opinion. But they find a way to be proud of those differences and still to live in a larger community and to avoid the kind of constant conflict that is a surefire losing strategy in a highly changing, rapidly more complex and challenging world. So anyway, that's why I like the Laurent Network. I like it when students in Europe and North Africa can participate in seminars thanks to technology with students in Malaysia. I like it when people have to get outside of their comfort zone and imagine what life is like for somebody else half a world away. And I like it when people are comfortable knowing that people half a world away are not so different from us after all. Most days I think to myself, I'd love to be 20 again, just to see what's going to happen. I imagine that I could go up to some young student here and say, I would let you be president of the United States if you'd let me be 20. <laughs> I'll take my chances on my future. Alas, no one has figured out in any faith how to make that deal. So I'm stuck where I am. I think you should be optimistic about the future. 
But if you think about just the things I mentioned about Morocco, just the headlines I mentioned, the trend, and compare that to all these places that are just in the grip of violence or the grip of conflict, just can't let go of the past and can't let go of defining themselves, not just by who they are, but by negative reference to somebody else. All you have to do is look around and see how you can build a better tomorrow. And I wish you well. Thank you very much.